Welcome, friends, readers, listeners, and viewers from across America and around the world. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. I thank all of you for taking the time to join us in live broadcast. I'm joined by my special guest, Noel J. Hadley, very prolific author, and has released The Unexpected Cosmology. We're going to talk a little bit about the past November Flat Earth International Conference, as well as the two-part book that he has coming, one shortly to be released and available, I believe, in preview now, and the other to be soon written. And so, Noel, are you there, brother? I am. Thank you, Zen, for having me on. It's my great pleasure, man. It was a Good to meet you at the conference and to get to share dialogue and to hang out some. And um, yeah, I'm excited about the project that you've undergone. It's been uh, quite an undertaking for you and interviewing and speaking with and writing down in story form the uh, what has become the collective awakening of the Flat Earth Movement um, in this modern time. And so... If you would, talk a little bit about it, but also I thought that it would be a perfect way for you to introduce this work by and the story in the background of how it came to, you know, the, as far as um, the whole project and the alignment of it, if you would share your trailer on it. And so if you would, can you read that uh, short clip? I can. This will be uh, this will be like reading Rainbow uh, by Noel J. Hadley. So <laughs> I <laughs> I've never read online before. This is gonna be great. Cool. So I so I actually uh, and I just want to say really quickly, Zen. Uh, th- I'm I'm excited to uh, to be on your show. Uh, the first the last time I was on was uh, let's see, it was a little over two years ago in 2017, and. I that was my first time ever being on like a any kind of broadcast, so I was like really really nervous, and uh, of course it was it was a great time, and I was racing to get home because we had spent half a year in Canada, and I was <laughs> I was actually trying to race home to get to the show, and we there was a hurricane that came through South Carolina, and it like devastated everything, and and in North Carolina like everyone was on boats and stuff because it was all flooded. And uh, and then it's kind of appropriate because I just got home um, a couple days ago from traveling. You know, we've been gone all year in Europe, so uh, it, it's it's I guess it's just appropriate to like every time I get home uh, from an extended trip to <laughs> to be on your show. So thanks for having yeah, me. Perfect. Yes. That's so great. I I did I did come out with this trailer, which I just basically read from the first page of my book. So what I'm about to read is just the first page, uh, and it. And here we go. Awaiting Colonel John Glenn's return to Earth was a handwritten message which simply read, Okay, wise guy. Its author was none other than Samuel Shinton, world-renowned and globally reviled flat earthist. In light of the three orbits which Glenn is claimed to have uh, completed on the 20th of February, 1962, the space race was perhaps his darkest hour particularly for those few remaining souls who still retained a faith in God's testimony to his own creation. This was the decade in which flat earthists Mark Sargent, Patricia Steer, Bob Nodal, David Weiss, Chris Van Maitre, and Rob Skeever were born. Robbie Davidson, Rick Hummer, and Shelley Lewis would follow along shortly thereafter and before the Apollo missions were over, but their voices would not be heard for nearly another half century. At present, Shinton alone held the torch. For this, he was scorned and ridiculed, in part because the press tugged at his enthusiastic and rather childlike heartstrings. Theirs was an archaeological artifact dangled for the self-flagellating reader, and yet which the vast majority of Americans caught in the current of Cold War science simply wanted buried. The strain was simply too much for him, the hour seemingly too dark, Shinton's conviction drained him financially and emotionally at a cost to his own health. He would suffer two strokes in 1963. The second left him with distorted vision, a disaster for his sign writing business. 
And in March of 1971, Shinten would not live to see the Apollo program he vehemently sought to prove as a series of elaborate hoaxes come to a close. Shinten died 68 years young. So that's the opening right there. Right on. Um, you, you are a very, as far as metaphors and adjectives, you are um, very flowery in your phrases. And uh, it really puts people where you are, and um, it really embellishes the story in a way that I think very few authors are capable of doing. And so I really enjoy reading your work. And also, if you would, can you tell people about your blog and also your previous material and where people can go to find it and also support you in your endeavors? Well, you know, it helps if you own a thesaurus. So yeah, <laughs> I, invest, I agree. I, I, I love invest, thesauruses. <laughs> I invested <laughs> in one a long time ago, so that always helps. Um, yeah. So, well, then, um, you know, you're really responsible for me, uh, believe it or not. I mean, you're really responsible for me entering into the 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 flat earth arena of uh, of writing books. And we could talk about that if we want. Uh, the first one, which two years ago I talked to you on your show about was avoid science falsely so called and at present um i have basically taken that all the all the essays off of that as well as the subject matter from others and i've kind of put it into one massive book called worthless mysteries and at present worthless mysteries can be purchased on amazon.com now, uh, the unexpected cosmology, which of course we're talking about tonight, can be purchased on Sacred Word um, Publishing. So, I'm I'm really uh, I'm thrilled, uh, Zen, that you uh, put it on there. Oh yeah, no, it's a great honor to be able to have it and include it, and to you know share your work with others. And um, I think it's interesting the the background of the story. And so, can you talk about that as well? Uh, your being in France and then Patricia uh, contacting you and then the idea for, you know, gathering all the stories and and what is the, you know, the backbone of the unexpected cosmology. Absolutely. Now, I would say that the, the main focus of most of my research within the Flat Earth movement has been Greek Hellenization. And... Uh, and how within Greek Hellenization and Greek Hellenization began in with uh, Alexander the Great when he uh, founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt and Greek Hellenization ended when Cleopatra and Mark Antony died in the city of Alexandria. And those few hundred years between is when a lot of the ancient mystery religions started going uh, public. And that's when Globe Earth came out of Plato. And so I researched a lot of that. Now, I had just published worthless mysteries last spring which was of course is a collection of you know three years worth of of writing on these on these subjects and we were going to europe my uh my wife and i we travel uh, most about seven to eight months out of every year and we were taking our kids and we we're going to go live in europe for several months and i was going there actually to target renaissance culture and I wanted to see firsthand a lot of the things I was researching, uh, specifically how – what's amazing about the Renaissance is that you basically have the occult coming out in your face and, and marketing their ideas uh, in science, but, but doing so – basically branding it and marketing it to Christians and making it look like, like Christianity. It's just a really interesting time. And so – we went over there. We spent three months in France initially, uh, and I was going to uh, uh, like the castle of Versailles, uh, the Palace of Versailles, and seeing where uh, King Louis the King Louis the Fourteenth literally. And I, I'm I, I'm not I'm not being metaphorical. He he literally worshipped Apollo, and and you go and see his fascination with Apollo everywhere, and and they're not even shy there of admitting to the fact that the Copernican Revolution was being pushed by guys like King Louis the Fourteenth and others because they worshipped Apollo, and that's really interesting. Uh -huh. And then we then we would go to places like um, 
uh, Chateau, Chateau. Um, I'm terrible at French guys, but it's uh, <laughs> let me let me uh, let me see. It's Chateau Chambord, Chambard, and this was uh, constructed by Da Vinci, and it's it's this huge castle that is built to look like the four corners of the earth, and in the very center of it, um, and this is pure Renaissance. In the very center of it is this double helix spiraling staircase. Now, keep in mind, this is a double helix staircase, you know, hundreds of years before it was discovered, quote unquote, in the 1950s. Uh And the double, what's fascinating about this staircase is that it it goes up through the layers of the castle all the way to the roof. And once you get to the roof, it's a huge dome. And on on top of that dome, they have serpents everywhere. And, um, and, uh, and like these Nephilim like creatures. And then it pierces through. And again, the, the tour guides are not shy there to say, yeah, this is actually the Tower of Babel piercing through heaven. And, and you, I'm seeing this stuff everywhere. I'm just shocked at just seeing this stuff and how bold and in your face it was during the Renaissance as they're pushing this and somehow marketing this off as, as Christian. Uh, you know, I went to uh, uh, Windsor Castle in, in England and, you know, among the many places we went. And, and uh, you know, I've never taken a um, – and I'm getting, to, I'm getting to Patricia Steer here. But I, I, yeah, yeah, no. I, yeah, no. I was in, I was, anyway, I was in Windsor Castle, and I've never taken a position on – uh, you know, the, 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 the queen of England, um, <laughs> you know, like, you know, all the different theories out there, like reptilian or whatever, but I will say this, it, it, I will say this, it was very interesting. And, and, you know, I know, uh, you know, all about, you know, the serpent sea doctrine and such, uh-huh. I, I will say this, every single room <laughs> you walk through Windsor castle and you see serpents everywhere, like serpents on, uh, door handles and serpents on vases and serpents up on the ceiling and then carved into the chairs. And you start getting this, this, you picture like, you know, like, I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but I think they really like serpents here. So, <laughs> so anyways, and this is what I was going there to do. I was just researching. I was taking all these notes and I was getting ready to write uh, a second volume to Worthless Mysteries. And um, so we're down in uh, the Dordogne uh, Valley of France, which is kind of the southeast. Uh, it's truffle country out there. And it's kind of close to the Spanish border. Or down that way. And I was down there going into a lot of the Neanderthal caves and seeing the old Crow Magnon Neanderthal art and what caves they still allow you to go into, which was phenomenal. Uh, and trying to understand, you know, where that was in relation to the mystery religions. And and I'm sitting uh, there. It's June of this summer. I'm, it, the, the sweltering heat, the summer's coming in. I'm sitting by a river in this old medieval um, village. And I see on social media that Patricia Steer had uh, deleted all her, uh, her all her social media accounts, Facebook, uh, YouTube, pulled everything off YouTube, um, uh, every everything on um, on Skype, everything. And um, I was I was devastated, not so much not so much that she decided to pull the plug, but the the reason why she did it. Um, now. When I spoke at Dallas uh, a few weeks ago, Robbie Davidson and I had agreed. Robbie Davidson is the uh, the man who founded the Flat Earth Conferences. We decided we we're going to do a Q&A on this book and uh, Patricia Steer. Now, we kind of assumed that everyone in attendance would know who Patricia Steer was. So I get up there on stage to speak, and I did a quick survey, and I asked for a raise of hands, how many of you in the audience know who Patricia Steer is? And only about a quarter to a third of the people raised their hands. And I knew knew in that moment, I'm in trouble, (laughs) because I'm here to speak speak on Patricia Steer, and a lot of people don't know about her. So I'll I'll say here, for those who are listening who may not know who Patricia Steer was, um, in the early years, and we're still in the early years of this modern Flat Earth Awakening, but for 2015, 16, and 17, into 18, into early 2019, she was a uh, a very big uh, dominant force within the movement, uh, particularly with Mark Sargent. And Mark Sargent and Patricia Steer, you can almost describe them like a Ca- uh, Regis and Kathy Lee, almost. Right. And, and um, she went through uh, a hell of a time where uh, just the, the kind of accusations that were thrown at her and the insults uh, are are really difficult to uh, to relay even over over the speaker right now. It's it really, really bad. And um, so I, 
I, uh, I called Rick Hummer up on the phone and that very day that I found out. And I was like, dude, Rick, what happened? And he explained it. And he's like, you know what? I, I actually still have her private number on my phone. I'll give her a call. So Rick Hummer calls her up and he gets back to me within like 30 minutes or so. And he says, dude, she wants to talk to you. Now, keep in mind that Patricia Steer and I had only talked once ever. And that was at the Flat Earth International Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina in 2017. And that's where I went to premiere uh, Void Science Falsely So Called. And I was sitting in the second row, um, and Mark Sargent and Patricia Steele were sitting together in the fr front row right in front of me. And it was just ecstatic in the room, so much energy, and I wanted to try to capture that in a photo. And Jaron went up to speak, and it was in his really a famous speech. It'll probably go down historically within Flat Earth, where he said that they're hiding God, which is a it was a big moment for Jaron. And so I lifted up my camera, I took a picture, and with Jaron up on stage and and Mark and Patricia in front of me, posted on Facebook. Thought nothing of it. About 20 minutes later, Patricia Steer turns around and she says, go ahead and pull it. It's natural. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And I had to look at my account. She went and looked at my Facebook page and someone had really posted that she's a man and you should pull her wig. And um, so I apologized for her. I felt terrible for that. Oh, my but God. But anyway, that was kind of our introduction together, which was very appropriate, uh, really, for our relationship that has developed over the summer. And uh, so I, I, I contacted her and, um, uh, and I asked her if she remembered that incident. She did. And uh, so we kind of had a little laugh about that. And for the following three hours, I was in this medieval village called Bells. It was like a 14th century medieval village. I uh, went down into the, the old wine cellar and uh, set up my microphone and, all that and listened in for about three hours as she, um, she was just – gave this very raw interview. I mean, this was a woman who was deeply hurt uh, in a lot of uh, emotional pain. And she just uh, just went into it and it just expounded on her experience that I was trying not to, I mean, I was kind of, I was crying through it and I was trying not to let her know. I mean, it was, it was tough. My wife was listening in the other room. I almost fell out of my chair a few times. And she's expounding on, it was the first time that she ever admitted it public would put it down on record that she was raped and that and essentially the man who raped her uh is the man who started the entire rumor that she is a man and um oh, and so that uh so i started uh she granted me the exclusive interview and i wanted to tell her story for a couple reasons one is that Hundreds of people out there have told her story, and if you were to get any two witnesses together uh, in any kind of court of law, they would not agree. Like it's just, it's just these wild accusations that people just, you know, imagine, and they just talk, I mean, just wild things about her that I don't even want to get into for graphic reasons uh, right now. And secondly, it's because I immediately thought of the story of the in the Gospels of the woman who is drugged in front of Jesus's feet, in front of Yeshua's feet, and. Um, and accused of adultery. And there's there's much commentary on this because, you know, where was the man and the way they did it? There was so many unlawful ways. And, you know, did she really commit adultery? There's just all these questions we have. And it almost becomes irrelevant whether she did or not. And what I started seeing was I started seeing Patricia Steer in the same position, thrown down into the mud, disheveled, and and everyone around just gawking and judging and laughing at her. And, and there was so much that going on. It made me sick. And I decided I'm going to go – I'm going to just extend a hand to her and, and, and you know, come to her, her defense. I actually thought that this would be – I would be destroyed. Like this was the end of me in Flat Earth. Uh, I actually wrote this as my farewell letter. I thought there's no way that I'm uh, – people are – I can never show an online presence again. People are just going to destroy me. So um, I basically – what we did is my wife and I, we drove out to the uh, French-Swiss border – and we, I locked myself up in this uh, 16th uh, century tower. It was almost like something of Rapunzel, and it was built by King Louis XIV. I had this beautiful view of the Swiss Alps, and I just sat out there for 10 days. And I always, you know, back in the day, wondered about – uh, these authors like Ray Bradbury and others who would talk about how they, in the 1950s, when they had no money or whatever, they would go to the Los Angeles Public Library and they would rent a typewriter and in like one week they would flesh out a novel. And and I was like, man, what would it be like to have that kind of inspiration? And, mm -hmm. you know, Patricia and I um, 
we talked for about 10 days. It was an ongoing interview for about 10 days. And I sat in there and I, I for almost a, the final week, I didn't sleep. Uh, it was just, it was almost like my own personal hell. It was one of the darkest, it was the, the toughest paper I ever had to write. And the entire time I was in communication with um, uh, Robbie Davidson, again, uh, FEIC, uh, Rob Skiba, and Rick Hummer, all three of those guys were extremely supportive of me. Uh, Robbie knew I was in a dark place, and he was, like, calling me every day and, you know, giving me moral support. And um, and there were times where I would tell him, like, guys, I don't think I'm, I should publish this. I think I need to toss it. I mean, it was, it was really hard to get through. And um, it ended up being about – uh, 30,000 something words. That's what David Weiss told me later. And basically a mini novel. I'm like, no one's going to read this thing. Um, and then like some weird things started happening. Like, uh, I'm sure you're familiar somewhat with the burning man, that event in like Nevada. Well, we were in these cow pastures in France and, <laughs> and the, the French equivalents or the European equivalent of the burning man essentially showed up in our backyard. Like this huge tent went up oh. and they have like these fires. And I guess sometimes people fall on the fires and get burned and they, you know, like these big orgies and stuff. And like, I'm there typing all night on the computer, trying to tell a story. And I'm hearing basically what I would describe as the soundtrack to hell, like all these, these voices crying up and moaning. And it was just, it was, it was, it was like something out of like, you know, uh, uh, like out of Dante or something. Uh -huh. And, um, anyway, so it finally got to the point where uh, after like not sleeping for a week and I get this thing fleshed out, I told Patricia, like, I'm done. Uh, let's just get this thing. I, I got her okay, published it, and I sat there and waited for the responses. And and I couldn't believe the responses were just – it just exploded within a couple – within that very day. And it's getting shared everywhere. You know, people are saying it's taking them two to three hours to read this thing, but they yeah. stopped their entire day. Like, you know, they – you know, that's all they did. And I couldn't believe I got thousands upon thousands of people to, to stop for like two three hours and read this thing. And it, it just – it was – it was an enormous success. I mean, the BBC read it, the, 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 like the New York post read it and journalists are contacting me. And it was just, it was, it was amazing. The support that came in for Patricia through this time. And, uh, I just wasn't expecting it. I don't, I, I don't know who was. And, um, because of that paper, um, it got it, what Robbie Davidson and I started noticing was that, well, we started talking about, let's turn this into a book, not on Patricia, but expanding it to the movement. And people like Bob uh, Nodal and uh, uh, well, I should say first that um, like David Weiss read it and uh, he didn't even talk to me about it. He was so inspired. He's like, I'm going to make this into a video. So I didn't know he was going to do that. He goes and gets Karen B and she narrates the whole thing and they made it into a video, which was wonderful. And, um, and so all these individuals, they wanted me to tell their story. And so, and Zinn, you were a part of it too. I contacted you and, um, and, uh, you know, Rick Hummer and, and, and Rob Skiba and Karen B and David Weiss, Bob Nodal, all these people, um, and started, they started telling me their stories over the phone and that's how this book came about. And so it's a, it's a very unique biography it's a, a i guess i should really call it an autobiography because it, you know we're telling the story ourselves but it's it's the first time that there's ever been an attempt to tell the story of the modern 21st century flat earth movement um by those who actually lived it and have been a part of it and so it, it was very organic in how i would turn over the microphone to everyone and say okay tell me about your life and uh, it was, and you know, Zen, you told me about, you know, your past and, and that was really exciting just to sit there and listen to that. And, uh, that's, <laughs> that's how I spent my time in Europe. Uh, I had to flesh that thing out, uh, write an entire book within, um, you know, like I think three months at this time, because Robbie Davidson, I agreed we would premiere this at the conference in Dallas. And the entire time he's like sending me like, you know, 60 days to Dallas, you know, 20, uh, you know, 30 days, 22 days. I'm like, stop, Robbie, stop. You know, I'm like getting all stressed out. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, we got it done. And, um, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it was a moment in time. I'll tell you. Awesome. 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 And, uh, and, uh, this book this expanded book from, 2015 to um, the November 2017 conference, and this next is picking up from there. Um, is that correct? And yeah, yeah. So it's uh, originally when I um, 
So what we basically did is the Patricia Steer piece, which was called Everything That Was Beautiful Became Ugly. And that's actually a quote that she told me just uh, you know, on the phone in the first initial interview, which I love that line. Yeah, I like we were going to use that. We we're going to use that entire article as the blueprint for the book. So it, you know, it kind of went from like, you know, her life from when she was born around 1970. Uh, no, 1963 uh, uh, was it? She was born 1963, and you know, kind of up to the present, 2019, and um, and so. But what started happening was, as I'm interviewing and talking to everyone, it started ballooning up really big. Uh, you'd use the word prolific. Uh, and you know, I was writing a lot. And so I had to make the decision. I was in um, Ireland, and I had to make the decision whether what I was going to do. I decided to cut it in half, which I'm so happy I did that. Okay. And yeah, uh, hold, hold on, Bill. Hold on. We're at first break. We'll pick it up on the other side. We'll be right back, everyone.
I think that your association with what happened to Patricia and the adulteress that was brought before Yeshua is a perfect analogy. And I was reading um, a collection of New Testament Apocrypha just recently, and it told about the 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 signs that Christ was writing and what he was writing into the sand when they had brought the adulteress um, there to be stoned before him. And it was really interesting in that what he was writing and how the crowd, the Pharisees were all gathered and they were all conspiring to murder uh, this woman and to have him participate. And they wanted, you know, they wanted him to, to join them in, in this kind of ritual slaughter. And basically, as they were gathered around him, he began to write in the sand. And they were interested in what he was writing. And while this portion of the story is left out of most texts, basically what he was writing was the sins that they had committed and the things that they were involved in. And so when he said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, the things that he was writing into the sand was convicting them of how they too were sinners. And he was revealing, you know, the things that they had done in their darkest and their innermost secrets and the kind of abomination that they were involved in because the Pharisees were doing all kind of just terrible, terrible things, you know, pedo pedophilia and things of that nature. And, uh, and so he was, you know, revealing to them uh, that they were worse sinners than she. And so they all scattered. And so that's, you know, part of the background of that story. And I think it, it shows that, you know, all of us, we are all sinners. We all fall short and none of us are perfect. Only our, you know, our Lord, our King, our Savior, uh, which is why he was able to, to redeem us. And so, um, and he encourages us to love even our enemies. And so uh, you're, you know, to putting that all together like that. Uh, I just wanted to share that with you and turn it back over to you, brother. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Uh, where was that? Where was that from that you read that? Uh, I'll have to look up uh, the the particular text because there's a number of, you know, different uh, ancient manuscripts that are just now released in a book called the the New Testament Apocrypha, and it was released by uh, Brent Landau and another individual, and he was the one that wrote the Revelation of the Magi, which tells the story of how. Um, Yeshua was the star of Bethlehem and how he descended out of the heavens. And then he led, because he had given Adam a prophecy of how he would lead the Magi to the cave of treasures and that they would bring the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh that Adam had left paradise with and that he, the Magi would bring that as gifts to him when he incarnated into flesh form here upon the earth. And so that yes. all, yeah, all that indeed happened. And it was part of that particular text is a second century uh, BC Syriac text. Um, no, um, second AD, um, but Syriac text. And, and so fascinating, incredible um, to read and study. And this individual, Brent Landau, um, he decided to release a lot of these other New Testament apocryphal texts. And one of the stories in there is what I'm telling you now of them, you know, revealing the sins of uh, the Pharisees and how they all scattered. Nice. I can't remember what I was saying before the commercial break. I was, uh, I went to get my coffee. <laughs> oh, you were talking about the, you know, the, what the second one, uh, that it would expand from after the November conference and what all it would entail. 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, I actually <clears throat> received uh, Robbie Davidson's uh, blessing to actually call it uh, the Flat Earth International Conference, um, a biography. And uh, so it's actually going to continue from where we uh, from where this leaves off, but it's going to be detailing uh, the conferences over the last three years, the last, uh, yeah, the last over three years and mm-hmm. all that they, you know, they did within the community. So, uh, and so because of that, I actually had to cut, uh, Patricia's story gets kind of cut in half too. Um, so, uh, that will be finished up, um, with, when the FEIC is released next year, uh, late spring, early summer. And uh, it was it was mostly done anyways. I mean, I had a it was just I really wanted to strengthen this this first third third of the story that we have here, the unexpected cosmology. So I spent the rest of my time working on that. Well, it's in, um, you know, I believe an incredible piece of work and it's something that will go down and because, you know, you basically collected all of the stories of all all the individuals that were really um, instrumental in gathering the momentum for bringing so many people to the truth of this particular revelation. And, um, and you know, I, I was proud and honored to be part of that as well. But can you talk a little bit about the stories of the different individuals, the kind of things that you learned in the intriguing aspects because you are bringing our stories forward and making us all uh, real in a way that I don't think has been done. And I think it's also um, something that honors Patricia because in her work and what she did, and which was a, a beautiful part of uh, bringing people, making them alive to the rest of the community, is that she would share the testimonies and do interviews with individuals that were just, you know, coming up and not even uh, real big on the scope, but just, you know, doing little things and being part of the movement and helping to make them real to everybody else and giving them a platform to really tell who they are and what they were doing and uh, what kind of influence others have had on them and and how they were using that inspiration for, you know, to help fuel the movement and different things like that. And so I think your book and the work and the stories that you are telling are also in the same manner uh, doing what she did uh, in her early involvement in the movement. Yeah, so a good example of that, and then I'll kind of uh, detail uh, how the stories kind of come together. A good example of that would be Karen B. So she uh, narrated this the article uh, that was put out by uh, that I wrote that David Weiss made into a video. So I called her up just to thank her and um, I wanted to interview her as well. And she started telling me about her life and she has gone through some um, some terrible uh, uh, civil or spousal abuse uh, for years. I mean, she had a very very difficult life. And so she was expounding on some of that, but she talked a lot about Bigfoot. And now Karen B lives on a property in North Carolina with her children, lives there alone with her children. And uh, she says that she has uh, Bigfoots, or I like to call them Sasquatches, who actually live on her property. Uh, she has said that she has never had a class A sighting, but she has had B and C sightings, but, you know, I guess, however they classify that and her children have seen them as well. And she kept talking about this. Now, this was important to her because she said that when she came into the flat earth movement, uh, that people were, you know, she wanted to talk about the fact that she says that Bigfoot lives on her property in North Carolina and nobody wanted to hear about, they're just like, shut up, Karen. We don't want to hear about this. You're, you know, you're derailing our movement. This is making us look stupid. Right. And so the first time she went on to Patricia Steer's show, flat earth and other hot potatoes and Patricia handed her the microphone and, and, and Karen talked about Bigfoot the whole time. And she said that that made her feel, that was so meaningful to her. And this is, this is what it was all about for Patricia because her show was, um, it was very different than a lot of other flat earth material out there. And I detail that a little bit in the book, but you know, in the early years, uh, in like 2000, 
14, 15, into early 16, uh, most people uh, didn't really put their names out there. Uh, of course, Zen, you put your name out there. Rob put his name out there. But, you, you know, you, you yourself, Zen, and, and Rob can attest to this. How devastating that could be on a career. I mean, you, 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 right? I mean, you, 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 you right. put. There's a lot at stake, right? So in the early years, most people were. Um, they didn't use the real names, not the real pictures. They would just do like a slideshow with like, uh, you know, scientific experiments. That's what it was like in the early years. It's all changed now. And Patricia Steer is one of the reasons. She was the first one to come out and hand people, you know, the microphone phone and say, "I want to know more about who you are as a person. Right. Tell me who you are." And um, and so. She really shifted the entire landscape as a result. And so I wanted the book to have that – to honor Patricia, I wanted it to have that same feel. So when I interviewed Karen B., I, we talked about Bigfoot and that you know people are going to read this and go, what does that have to do with the Flat Earth story? Well, she's a, she's a major uh, a player in the Flat Earth movement. She's in Flat Earth Core, and you know, this is something that has influenced her. So um, you know, one of my um, – one of back in the day, I don't really watch the movies anymore. Back in the day, one of my favorite movies was Forrest Gump. People are going to laugh at that, but you know, it's either like a love hate relationship. Either people hate Forrest Gump or they're like, yeah, that's, you know, that's a fun movie. But, um, what I loved about that movie is, you know, I used to dissect films a lot and, and the entire theme of that movie is movement. Um, every single person in that movie, in that movie, all the three main characters are handicapped. Uh, you know, Jenny can't fly. Lieutenant Dan has no legs. Forrest Gump, uh, he has to, you know, learn to run. And, and you can look at every single scene and just constant movement, starting with the leaf, the, uh, the feather, the blows, and it's just movement. And, 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 and in a way, this book has a very similar feel to it. it, it it's, it, I, I almost, I, I don't know if I should say it's like Forrest Gump and Flat Earth, but it's, it's, it's this, it, uh, you you see the way that that movie takes it like a like a almost like a quilt kind of uh, fabric feel to America, uh, a patchwork feel uh, to the American story through the decades. This has a very similar feel to it because you have all these different players. Uh, as in you were you you expanded on your years in as a, a deadhead as a traveling deadhead. I found that fascinating. You got um, you know uh, someone like Shelley Lewis who uh, wanted to enter the space program and she goes to West Point and becomes lieutenant. And then, you know, she's wow, crippled wow. by, um, she's crippled by the vaccines they gave her there. And, uh, her life was kind of ruined through that. And, um, you know, it just, it just, it was fascinating getting everyone's different stories through the years and where they were when, you know, when September 11th happened and, you know, the, the thought process and the things that motivated people. And so there's a lot of very pleasant surprises like that in this in this book. And there will be in the next one as well, um, like uh, in the Flat Earth International Conference. For example, I just interviewed uh, – if anyone here knows, uh, some people know him as Flat Earth Man or, or Conspiracy Music Guru. Yeah. Uh, his name is Alex Michael. Yeah. He's a guy that – yeah. He's a, kind of like that, you know, like that cowboy guy that writes all the you know, the funny flat earth songs, and I interviewed him, and he was just telling me these again, these like intimate stories about his life, like you know where he met his wife. Uh, he used to be a DJ, and uh, he would um, like 15 years ago, uh, he was a DJ, and he had a a pad of paper and a pen or pencil always by his booth because people would come up and uh, give requests for songs. And then this, he said this beautiful woman walked up and she didn't request a song. She just put down her phone number and said, you know, meet me later tonight. And from that moment on, you know, they've been attached at the hip, you know, and you, you're just, these, uh -huh. you're, it's, it's just fun. Just, you know, seeing all these individuals like Bob Nodal and and uh, and David Weiss as as real people, real flesh and and bone people, and there's when we're in the when we're in the YouTube world and we're on social media, you know, we kind of lose sight of that a lot. You know, we just think of them as you know the research, and I don't like what you you know I don't like this research or that research, and you know you start attacking people, and and you know and it, it, it we lose sight of the fact that these are just real people, you know opening books, doing research, coming to conclusions, sitting behind a microphone, putting their names out there and, you know, putting their entire lives, it's, you know, on the line here just to present this and then just get attacked by everyone. And, and that was, you know, I, something I really hope people can pull away from this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's to, 
to have more, you know, definitely patience in the community. Uh, because it's just the community as a whole right now is just it is so fractured and and just people just it's it's bad out there. <laughs> it's you've seen it, Zen. I mean, you know what? Oh it's, yeah, I know, brother. <laughs> For a very long time, and the, you know, again, that's why I like the theme of the whole, you know, uh, the adulteress and the go forth and sin no more and let he who is without sin cast the first stone because. You know, when you really put it down to that level, none of us are worthy to judge each other or to stone each other or to, uh, you know, to cast the first stone because we are all sinners. We all fall short. And so um, I think that's a lesson that we should all learn better from and embrace in greater clarity because, um, again, I think it's 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 a theme of you know our being in a fallen state and our being and needing to be redeemed through christ uh, who as god incarnate has the power the authority he is the arbiter of life and death and he can redeem us to salvation and to eternity uh, as long as we are numbered and counted worthy of the elect and we see that in john um the entire chapter of john as far as those that hate their brethren and that are the accusers of that's, you know, that's what Satan does. You know, that's not what um, those we're commanded to love each other and to be tolerant and also to be, um, um, you know, to realize our own shortcomings before trying to point out and judge and condemn and criticize and uh, others in, in emotionally or uh, thinking that we are superior in some manner, holier than thou, you know? Well, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in the young earth creationist movement and I, I, I was for years, a punching bag for organizations like answers in Genesis. And I grew up in a kind of environment where young earth creationism would be argued in the back of churches. You know, you would have like the the one pastor who's like a Darwinist and another who's like, a you know, he's like maybe like not the senior pastor, but he's really into young earth creationism. And you would like argue in the back and you would pop on some like Kent Hovind video or something like that on a Sunday night. And in all those years arguing for young earth creationism, I never had an atheist uh, look at the moon landing and go, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus must be the son of God. Or I've never had, you know, arguing with an atheist or agnostic or whoever and about, you know, the earth being created in, you know, six days or, you know, being 6,000 years old and, and they'd go, oh yeah, that, you know, that you've, got me that seems about right like no one ever came to that conclusion but there's something about this flat earth movement that is is it is is phenomenal how many people are encountering this and they're going oh my goodness there's a creator you know we're, we're, we don't come from evolution we don't come from some big bang accidents you know we're not just you know we're not whatever I, you know it's coming out of some soup or whatever right, and right. and accidental random chaos you know and yeah. yeah, and so and so in this movement, we've got. I have never been in a movement like this where we're we're seeing all these people from different uh, uh, belief systems. You know, former atheists, agnostics, to some you know many in the new age, and they're all coming into this. And one of the and this is the greatest witnessing uh, um, the, the greatest witnessing opportunity I have ever seen in my entire life. I don't. I I, I can't imagine there being almost something bigger than this. It's right. it's so it's so huge and so. You've got people like uh, Patricia Steer or others like uh, David Weiss or Bob Nodal who aren't Christian. They don't say yeah. they're Christian. They, they don't pretend to be. And in a lot of ways, I really appreciate that because they're not a hypocrite, right? They're not right. saying they're Christian and pretending to be and saying all the right words but not showing any fruits or anything like that. And so one of the things and the reason I brought up also in the, the, the article I wrote on her about the woman who was supposedly caught in adultery um, <clears throat> is that – for for many in the uh, so-called Christians in the flat Earth movement, they were attacking and accusing her because she wasn't Christian yet. Like you know, it's like you know, and it's like guys, like she's not there yet. Uh, you know, you can't you can't attack someone because they're not a Christian, right? Like right. like our job is to our job is to pray for them and to plant seeds and to yes. cheer them on and and tell them about Yeshua and 
And so, you know, that was that was a huge motivator in a lot of this. And um, it's 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 one of the ways I've come full circle in this movement, because, uh, as you know, Zen, I mean, I I was um, I had a really tough time processing a lot of the movement. And it's 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 taken me a long time. And and in a lot of ways, this, this book is almost my own. It's a bit of my own biography of where I've come from. And 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 recognizing all the different uh, personalities in here. And, you know, I can't this isn't this isn't just when I'm not in the back of a church anymore. Right. I mean, I'm not back to watching Kent Hovind videos anymore. This is we're in the bare knuckled street and this is just very different now. Yes. Um, I don't know if you would be willing to speak a little bit about your story as well, but. Um, it it costs you also to stand with this movement and to speak your truth and um, it, you know I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing that aspect of your story um, but certainly I'd like to also talk about you know David Wise because you're very correct as far as people that have been totally anti-Christian anti-God anti anything religion or spiritual. Um, and that, you know, and also like Bob Nodell being a scientist, that many that come from that kind of a background, they do not in any manner support intelligent design or uh, there's being a God behind the establishment of the creation and were a completely militant, atheistic uh, towards anything with such concept. And so I think David Wise is a perfect example in that. And for him to even now, you know, have come full circle and realize intelligent design and that God established everything, I mean, that is such a huge and bold uh, change of stance for him. And, you know, yeah, we pray and understanding that, yeah, this is also encoded into the Bible and the Bible being 100% prophetic and accurate over thousands of years, if they begin to study and to examine and to look at greater detail at the biblical cosmology encoded into the scriptures, perhaps then they learn as well as to Yeshua being the Son of God, you know, Yahushua, Yah's salvation. Um, and the, the reason, you know, learning about the, the enmity between the bloodlines and the fall of humanity are being in a fallen world. Now, uh, the reason we see and are surrounded by the devils, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, uh, the perpetuation of evil in this world, how and why it is all like that and why Satan has been given temporary reign and over this realm, you know, those kind of things are also biblical concepts and biblical uh, revelations. And so, um, People hopefully will get to that aspect of the scriptures and truth as well. And then once they do, then, you know, you can't help but become and know that uh, salvation is through Christ because he is the son of God. He is the preexistent, the self-existent one, and that he has the authority of life and death and his resurrection affirms that. Yeah, there's um, a couple interesting things that uh, uh, Bob Nodal and David Weiss told me that are in the this first book. One is that David Weiss said that he would, uh, if he was listening to any kind of conspiracy theory or a proposed truth or anything like that, and then he found out that that person was a Christian, he would immediately turn it off and be like, "This guy is an arrogant, you know, person. He obviously doesn't know anything. I'm not listening to him." And he's he's really come around now where he's like. He's like he sees this in the Bible, and he's like, "Wow! Like the, actually, the Bible testified to this. Uh, scripture testifies to this." And you know, he's he's much more. He's really listening now, and he's really. Um, uh, but you know, then there there's certain people in the community that really turn him off to Christianity too. And so it's a uh, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of tug of war going on in here. But there's another thing that Bob Nodal told me that was really interesting. He because you know he's not a Christian either, uh, but he's had a lot of you know talks. Uh, he talked to me and you know Rob Skeeb and a lot of people about this. But he was telling me during our interviews that 
you know, he looks around and he sees all these, he knows, so he knows that the earth is flat and he's like, okay, wait a second here. All the governments of the world are hiding this. All of them are in uh, collisions, he got, you know, uh, collusions together. And, and it, it, it started occurring to him, like, wait a second, maybe, maybe Satan is real. Like maybe there really is some evil, you know, entity out there that is, that is. Yeah, hold that thought. Be right back. All right, welcome back, back, everybody, for a second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio. 
And I'm honored to have as guests with me for this evening, Noel J. Hadley. And we are talking about the unexpected cosmology as well as our experience with and being part of the Flat Earth Awakening, the modern Flat Earth Awakening, and the work that Noel has done in sharing the stories of the many different individuals that have been instrumental in playing a part in this movement. And um, we were talking about, before going to break there, that individuals like uh, David Weiss and uh, Bob Nodal, who, even though they are not Christians, that the understanding that we live in an enclosed cosmology and that there is intelligent design behind the structure of not only the creation, but also of us being made in the image of God, that if truly there you know is a god that established this and and that it wasn't just a product of evolutionary random chaos coming together in some kind of miraculous fashion to uh, create life then you know the other aspect of that is if there's a god certainly there must be some organized evil and that we are contending against what everybody keeps bringing up and all the politicians themselves keep speaking about with regard to a new world order. And so uh, let me turn it back over to you, Noel, and give you a chance to uh, first give out your website blog page again once more uh, where people can go to find your work, and then let's continue uh, with the, the stories. Well, I do most of my writing on uh, Our Way is the Highway. Uh, that's my my blog where I release my articles, and uh, you can, of course can find the unexpected cosmology on Sacred Word Publishing uh, in their bookstore. And uh, if anyone listening who would like to uh, you know get to know me better, come uh, come by Facebook and um, and send in a friend request. I'd love to get to know you guys. So <clears throat> you know. Continually, we're finding with these stories like, uh, you know, Patricia Steers is something very similar to uh, David Weiss and, um, and Bob Nodal that, you know, she started out kind of a kind of semi agnostic, kind of atheist, kind of similar teetering between the two, you know, really more apathetic. I think that's a really better word to describe a lot of people. They were just very apathetic mm-hmm. towards anything spiritual. And all of a sudden, she's also, you know, dealing with the same thing. There's a creator. And but the next question is, who is the creator? And of course, we want to the, the we want to get everyone to the father. And the only right. way to do that is through Yeshua, the, the our, our spotless Passover lamb. And we need to get people to recognize that there are sinners who need a Messiah, a savior. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a huge step. And this is just continual proof in my mind of what this huge agenda is. It's what Jaron said, they're hiding God. That's yes. it. I mean, they're they're hide, they they want us to be completely apathetic to uh, any any kind which uh, apathy in my mind is a type of evil, but it's it they want us to just not even think about it or care or you know, and that's what this does. So a good example would be a lot of us are what this flat earth uh, revolution awakening has done is has has con- not only confirmed scripture, but uh, made us more passionate in our faith. And a good yeah. example of that would be Paul on the plane. And Paul and I, have, you know, he's become a, like my new BFF. I mean, we, you know, we were hanging out uh, last week and we got our families together. He's just an incredible guy. And yeah, this Paul. guy. This guy was totally into Star Wars. Okay, so in 2012, when Disney purchased Lucasfilm, I think it was four billion dollars, and Kathleen Kennedy took over as president, uh, it was an interesting time in history because Star Wars was already huge. But now, what Disney did is they wiped the slate clean, and they were starting from scratch. And so, a lot of people, uh, an entire new generation of bloggers and YouTubers got in on this because they knew they could go from the ground floor up and become really big in social media. And, and they did. I mean, you know, you, you look at any Star Wars YouTube video that comes out and like within like, you know, two hours, it's already got like 200,000 hits or something. I mean, it's, it's incredible, right? And so he, uh, Paul was huge on Star Wars and he was a blogger and, and blogger, vlogger, you know, everything, you name it, podcaster and um, uh, he, uh, in 2017, he actually 
purchase, he had already gone to like the conferences and he met like he has this photo of him with Mark Sargent and Carrie Fisher at the same time. And he purchased this stormtrooper outfit. It was a special outfit that you actually have to construct and mold yourself to fit your own body. And he said it's like anywhere from like a six month to a year long process to build it. It's like a big deal, I guess, and you know, in the conventions and stuff. And uh, and he he started working on that, and then he discovered flat Earth in 2000. And uh, you know, it was 2016, late 2016. And he you know he jokes that you know flat Earth ruined his life. Uh, <laughs> and, and that that the stormtrooper outfit is still in a box <laughs> in his garage. Yeah, and, that's funny. Um, and but the thing is with uh, Paul is that. Uh, my point is, is that he was always kind of, um, I, I don't know. I mean, he would probably describe it like this. He didn't in the interview, but as a, what you call lukewarm or a backslidden Christian, right? It was just someone who didn't really, a lot of apathy, didn't really think much about it, kind of identified as a Christian, but it made him incredibly like it made, uh, the creator or Yahweh just it's so close, you know, when you realize yeah. that he's right up there physically in heaven, looking All down right. at it. Right. And, uh, yeah. he's, and he's not only, because I mean, he's, uh, I'll, I'll kind of save it for him to talk about it more in uh, the next book, uh, going to take on the world that Chris and Liz Bailey put on. And he's become much more, uh, you know, uh, passionate about Torah, which is something that I myself have done because of Flat Earth. Flat Earth uh -huh. brought me to that. And if it's okay with you, I'd kind of like to kind of read um, some... Uh -huh some observations I've had over the last year that for me is really what the, the, the full revelation of everyone, you know, wants to be like, well, what is, what is really the purpose? What is this really leading us to? And, um, is it okay if I just read something off that yeah, I, I wrote? Please. Yeah. yeah please and this will be, and I really like that you have, uh, during this interview, the, the stars circling around because, the, the th one of the underlining themes you said I, you like to use a lot of metaphors and things I do, um, and one of the underlining themes is going to be stars in my next book that I'm working on now, and uh, stars from a, uh, a a flat Earth perspective, meaning that we are getting rid of natural revelation of astronomy and going back to what Scripture says stars are. So there's okay. an interesting there's an interesting passage from the Testament of Naphtali. Okay, so this is the 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 twelve patriarchs, and I'm I'm sure you're very familiar yes. with that. Yeah. Yes, in, in, so this is, comes from Natali, in which the sixth son of Jacob instructs his children how to live in accordance with Yahweh after his inevitable passing. After first reminding them, quote, for God made all things good in their order. And this is key, in their order. The patriarch then expounds, let all your works be done in order order with good intent and fear of Elohim and do nothing disorderly in scorn or out of its due season. Now, Naphtali is, he's laying on his deathbed pleading with his children not to corrupt their doings. And he is using the luminaries as an example. And this is key. Actually, he's quoting from first Enoch. He says the Gentiles went astray and forsook Yahweh in like manner. The watchers from Enoch also change the change the order of their nature, whom Yahweh cursed at the flood, on whose account he made the earth without inhabitants and uh, fruitless. Um, so, so you, we have to ask the question: Wait a second, the watchers acted in like manner, quote unquote, as the Gentiles, and what are the Gentiles doing? So, quite contrarily, this according to Naphtali, the sun and moon and stars do not give up their order. So, so what he's saying here is, he says, so do ye also change not the law of Elohim in the disorderliness of your doings? Did you catch that? The, the, the good of Elohim's creation week were the moon and the sun and the stars working in a harmonic, um, har harmonic and orderly fashion. Right. And this is what Ilhim expects of his children. So right. according to the Testament of Nistali, the sin of the watchers is ongoing. This is described as changing the order of their nature. Right. Um, Jude describes these angelic luminaries as the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Yes. And wh what is the... And what result? after strange flesh. Yeah. And... Um, 
And of course, the the punishment is they're thrown into the lake fire that is actually created for them. And the watchers they change the law of God. So this is this is what I want to get at here because I, I'm noticing that uh, what there's 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 this theme with the stars of transgressing the law yes. of Yahweh. Yes. And so we know that in Scripture we have either sheep or goats, and the sheep and goats will be separated. Well, it, it's the same thing. According to Scripture, according to, if we throw out natural revelation, which is all false of astronomy, and we look at what Scripture says of stars, do you have stars or planets? A planet is a wandering star who has transgressed the law of Yahweh. So the question is, are we a star or a planet? Mm -hmm. And the planets, their sins are being... Uh, compared to the sins of of Sodom and and Korah's rebellion. Well, wait a second. What did Korah rebel against? He rebelled against Moses, but he rebelled Moses, against the, the, law. Uh, the law. Yeah. Yes. And so that that's fascinating because the thing is, is in in this in this flat Earth revelation, if we if we don't recognize that, that it, it's pointing us to uh, the, what is eternal. Uh, you know, God Elohim, God is unchanging. And he has laid before us the two witnesses, heaven and earth, right? right. And so, which is so appropriate for flat earth, it's heaven and earth. Right. And yes. uh, and so that is what has, um, that is what has dramatically altered my life in exciting and joyous ways. And it's it's exciting watching so many others like Paul and others uh, come to those same conclusions. And there's other people that uh, big players in this movement that I can't mention yet, who I know are going in this direction, but they haven't. Come come out of the closet yet and um and they will very soon and so it's just it's it's really exciting to see where our father is leading us in these days yes, yes. absolutely i fully agree with you brother and the other thing uh is that we don't even realize to what extent um this movement is affecting people behind the scenes as you said because there are a lot of people that are reviewing the material that are being f affected deeply and that are also examining scripture in renewed perspective that are you know again being led to the truth of the prophecy and the other aspects of scripture which they had not really embraced previously and that is again changing people's lives and affecting relationships in a very profound manner and so we're just really now seeing the beginning of what is the snowball effect of um, the waves going out from the ripple effects of you know the initial first three years of the organization and the communication and people coming together speaking about and sharing um, dialogue and relationship with one another on all of these different things. And yeah, I mean, it's really just now even beginning to, to, to pick up momentum in truth. Yeah, that was, uh, one of the, of course, exciting things about, uh, talking to people as well and, um, uh, realizing how, one of the things I really wanted to push in this book is that, is that uh, God has kind of pushed, um, there's been gradual, I guess, revelations that have kind of lit up to this. And when you're looking at um, the Young Earth Creationist movement, for example, that is only 50 years old, most people don't realize that. And when we're talking about that, you know, there's 6,000 years from, you know, Genesis to now. Um, and this came from a guy like Dr. Henry Morris, uh, of course, during the Apollo missions, interesting that he decided he was going to throw out all, all natural revelations, except for astronomy. They kept to astronomy. And so now we're here 50 years later and saying, wait a second, let's, let's finish this and let's throw out astronomy as well. But then you have couples like, uh, Chris and Liz Bailey. And do you know Chris and Liz Bailey? You kind of promote yeah, them. Yeah. Take, yeah. Take on the world. Yeah. yeah. And they... Um, they came out of Cleveland and they were raised in, uh, this was fascinating for me to research while I was writing this book, because a lot of people don't know about the geocentric movement in Cleveland. Right. It, was, it was a real thing back starting in the sixties and the seventies. And, and, uh, they were raised in their school where they met their high school as geocentrists. Yeah. And, yes. and, 
yeah, back in the 90s. And the geocentric movement, actually, it's kind of funny, like uh, Dr. Sejanus, he came out with that film. Um, what was it called? The uh, the principle, yeah. yeah, and it's like right around 2012, 13, 14, the geocentric movement seemed to be kind of taking off and catching momentum uh, under Sejanus and a couple of other guys, and and then all of a sudden Flat Earth showed up and just you know obliterated them, and uh, you know so they're they're pretty sore about that. Uh, but <laughs> it, again, it's 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 a shame that a lot of the people in the geocentric movement they can't they can't right. you know they can't see this, but uh, okay. so. Yeah, unfortunate. Um, well, yeah. Can do you mind uh, sharing some more stories? Because, like, you know, again, I think that is what the beautiful thing of actually attending the conferences and meeting people, you know, that our work has deeply affected, and uh, getting to to actually uh, share hugs and meals and conversations with people that have been listening to our work and reading our materials and that have been affected by um, the things that we are doing on levels that we're not able to visualize and not able to see. And it is a beautiful thing, you know, to come together um, and to share, you know, again, just friendship and relationship and and laughter and, and story and meal. And uh, that's uh, what I really like about, you know, those particular gatherings and our chances to to come together as community in that way, it really feels like almost a reunion of sorts, like a family gathering, uh, which has been a wonderful thing. But there has there been strife and differences, strikes and, differences and, all that, but, and all that. But yeah, yeah. please. Um, yeah. So there's one of the one of the amazing. Uh, I, I think the stories that are going to really touch a lot of people is following Rob Skiba and what he's been through, and uh, you know, particularly with his uh, Chicago experiment, I remember when that happened in 2016, and th watching that when when he when he when he and Ruck Helmer took that boat across uh, Lake Michigan all the way up to Chicago and back, and you could see it the whole way. I mean, I was in tears. I was just you know I was seeing this dark room, just like it, it was such a confirmation for so many of us, but particularly for Rob Skiba because. You know, again, you kind of went through something similar, Zen, but you can identify with this that when he started testing the globe, man, that guy was just people were pulverizing Skiba. I mean, he he was just like, I'm done with this. And he was, you know, he he there was that time where he put up uh, that Phil Collins song on testing the globe, and he's like, guys, I'm done with this. And um, so it was, but even a guy like Rick Hummer, you know, he started out. Uh, well, back in the 90s, he was in Hollywood. He's telling me these stories. I was like, you know, his basketball buddy is George Clooney. And they're like playing basketball while he's filming uh, Batman and Robin. And then Will Smith shows up. And they're all, you know, he's telling me all these stories. Uh, he's a fun guy to talk with. But when September 11th happened, uh, he was a, uh, a disc jockey uh, or a shock jockey. And he was, uh, you know, he was telling me how, you know, he was beating the war drum. And He's on the radio, you know, you know, you know, singing patriotic songs out there and let's go get the bad guys and all this kind of stuff. And it took a World War II veteran to call him up while he was on the radio station and challenge him and, you know, that over building uh, over building seven. And um, and so it's, it's yeah, it's it's been great just seeing how a lot of these people, uh, a guy like Rob Skiba, you know, uh, or Shelley Lewis, you know, going to West Point, Rob Skiba was the same way. He wanted to go into space. He wanted to enter the space program. And so he went to the army, uh, to become a helicopter mechanic because he wanted to be able to, you know, you know, be able to fix these things, but also he got his pilot training. And that was a fun interview, by the way, because he, uh, I almost wish I could just like release that, uh, on YouTube because I'm just sitting there and Rob Skiba is like, he's like putting on like this, uh, this almost like this radio drama for me. As you know, he's like a very visual storyteller. And so he, like, he's doing all the voices of the drill sergeants and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> it was just, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, just to see the extents of where all, all these individuals have come to, to, to have to drop the pride and say, yeah, I, 
think the earth is flat. And that's something people just can't wrap their heads around, you know, this idea that we're, you know, all these flat earthers are just these stupid people who've never seen pictures of, you know, uh, from satellites in space of the earth. And yet these people, a lot of these people I interviewed were trying to get into the space program. They were as indoctrinated as you get. And they were, you know, super edge, you know, very educated. And, um, and yeah, so there, there's that there. Um, let's see what else I'm trying to think. Uh, huh. but, um, uh, um, September, uh, September 11th was, um, I think an integral part. Um, and one thing I actually wanted to include in this book when I was in Oxford and kind of finishing up the, uh, towards the end of the book, we were staying in Oxford for a month and C.S. Lewis and, uh, J.R.R. To- uh, Tolkien, they uh, they were called the Inklings, and they met in this pub called the Eagle and Child for like thirty years or something like that. And I that kind of became my hangout spot. I went through and and and, and to write, and I wrote this um, this I think the most intimate section I wrote about myself was actually about my wife, and uh, it was the first time I ever wrote about it. And my uh, my wife, her. Um, I wrote this whole thing on the uh, the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, and there was an interesting paper that was written in 1983, in which uh, it's it's a pretty historical piece, and I quote from it. It was written by a uh, homosexual who was, uh, you know, terrified of all his friends that were dropping over dead, and he he said an interesting thing in there. He said that. Um, he said that there are no confirmed cases anywhere of a non-homosexual having AIDS. And he questioned that. He said he doesn't believe that narrative. He thinks that they're hiding it. And I found that really interesting because in 1982, my wife uh, was born in May of 1982, and her mother contra- uh, contacted the uh, HIV virus, uh, the AIDS virus, in the hospital through a blood transfusion giving birth. And it was actually uh, hidden. Uh, nobody knew about it. My own wife did not know about it. And her mom was uh, completely abandoned and shunned because of uh, mainly because of Jerry Falwell. And Jerry Falwell was uh, he uh, had a some people think he was, you know, like CIA backed. I mean, this guy had uh, the 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 moral majority behind him. He got Reagan elected and he actually was going out there and saying that if you uh, were to even try to save anyone who has AIDS, then you're getting in the way of the wrath of God. You need to step away. And so this was an embarrassment to a lot of people. And um, it was so embarrassing that uh, my wife's mother had contacted AIDS that she was completely abandoned by her entire family, her husband, everyone. And she died a very lonely death. Um, and those who I have... Um, uh, interviewed who knew her back then to, uh, have confirmed this and they're like, yeah, she was crying out for help and there was no, you know, no one there to help her. And, um, my wife didn't even find out that her mom died of AIDS until after we were married. And the first time that I went and visited her mom's grave was, uh, I think in, uh, 2012 and my wife was not yet 30 years old. She was, uh, 29. And, she was at that time, I looked at the gravestone of her mother, Rebecca, and um, and I noticed that my wife was older than her mom when she died. And I just, I was like, you know, it, it was just one of those, I couldn't believe it moments. Wow. It was just it, the, the, the years of of the, her silence and the pain that my wife went through, you know, that, that she was still crying about when we were first married and, uh, and, you know, losing her mother and not knowing why and, and, and all the shame in her family. And this is one of the themes that it kind of builds in the book when you even see with Patricia Steer that, of, um, the, the shame that is put on people by many of the moral majority majority uh in the church and and so-called christians and and their treatment of of you know people of these so-called adulteresses that are flung down in the in the dirt and so that was the very thing with her mother and you see a lot of these themes kind of playing in and you someone who reads the book from beginning to end should should you know note between patricia's dear and then what happened to my wife's mother and where she same thing like 
she must have been it must have been the wrath of God on her. She must have sinned right to get this. And uh, that's the way she was treated. And so that was um, that was, you know, a very intimate moment that uh, I shared in the book. And it's never been publicly written about before. Actually, talking about it on a show right now is the first time I ever talked about. It. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had people. <laughs> I've had people reading the book and like they get to that portion in the early 80s when I'm talking about the satanic panic of the early 80s. And they're, they're just saying like uh, this one woman was reading to her husband my book in bed and she said like she couldn't finish it. She was crying and that kind of stuff. So uh, it, it's touching a lot of people. And and there's just a lot of really touching stories in here that is, is really going to move people. And and everyone who's listening um, I, I think one of the, I want everyone to know one of the I think the main draws here is that it. Oh, we got another commercial break. Okay, we'll be right back.
of all the different individuals that you had chance to interview, which I think that in and of itself is very unique in that you have a perspective um, in being able to interview each of us personally that not a lot of people have. Uh, even though, yes, we have all um, met each other in, you know, at the convention, uh, but even still, I, I haven't sat down and talked with everybody in the depth and in the manner that that you have. And so, um, yeah, I think it's uh, intriguing. And the fact that you put it all together in, in book form is also uh, remarkable. Uh, the other thing is, um, have you considered actually sitting down with individuals and doing like a um, video or a film presentation. Cause I think that would be really cool as well. It, it would be, um, it, I, I've put some thought into it. Um, uh, I think though that there's probably others that would be much better at that than I would, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, my gift is writing and, yeah, and yeah. uh, and as I always tell people that, you know, I, I totally understand that in this day and age, everything is, is, you know, YouTubing and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so much of it is. And, um, you know, one of the things that really caught my attention was uh, reading an article several years ago that the two big, you know, powerhouses of information in the world, the New York Times, the LA Times, and yeah, I know it's a mainstream media and all that, but they, they, uh, they talked about how like the LA Times laid off like two thirds of its staff over a few years period, uh, its writing staff. And the only ones who survived were those who were vlogging because it, it sent the clear message that those who are vlogging are, you know, uh, that's more important than words, right? But as I tell people like Robbie Davidson and others that I'm, you know, I'm trying to bring journalism to flat earth like it's 1950. And so, <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think it's important because it's, um, you know, one of the things that I, I hope that my book can accomplish is, you know, we don't really know, we don't really know if there's gonna be a purge that's gonna happen on YouTube or, um, you right. know, the censorship is getting really, really bad. And one of the one of the the facts that we have to to deal with, and this is one of the things that's great about the conferences, is that um, you're, if you try to look for any kind of information now on the subject of cosmology, you have to filter first through, you know, dozens if not hundreds of hit pieces against right. it, right? And yeah. it's all changed. I mean, I remember back in like 2016, 17, you could look up a certain subject, and you know, it's there, like it's on top of the. But it's right. all changed now. Now the only way to really do it is to actually look through personalities. Like you go to like you know Zin Garcia, Rob Skiba, these you know these individuals. And so what I hope one of the things I hope my my book has a twofold approach. One is for those who are not flat earthers but are curious, but maybe are a little hesitant over a lot of the content and stuff that they would actually take an interest in the personal lives of those involved. And, you know, reading about like you Zen and others and, and, and going, wow, like, you know, these are real flesh and blood, you know, people and and actually then pursuing further, you know, through, you know, your research and other people's research, uh, but also those who have um, uh, done nothing but uh, looked at all the research in this movement and actually being able to connect with the personalities behind that are motivated uh, by the information. So once again, you know, just this is really a, a, a really personal piece. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so uh, you had you had asked a little bit earlier. You wanted me to kind of touch on um, on some of my personal journey. Yeah, yeah. If, if you don't mind, and and just the you know the cost to you as well in standing for this truth, because you know all of us paid a price, and when we decided to uh, to stand for the revelation of flat Earth and biblical cosmology, and um, you know how it affected you in your own personal life. Well, yeah. Now, I was I was raised as a um, in a as a PK, and that's an acronym for pastor's kid. I was raised in a parsonage, uh, and my I would say my parents raised me right. Um, and I, I there if they ever hear this story, they're probably sick of me telling it. But uh, I tell this story ultimately in hopes of of honoring them by continuing to do what they raised me to do. And one of the the key phrases in my household growing up. Or, or, or ways of, of engaging any kind of conversation would be 
the reformers call of sola scriptura. Now, I know a lot of people have issues with that, but essentially sola scriptura, the way I define it, the way I was raised to, to uh, believe it, is, is that uh, scripture alone. Now, by this, uh, that we are to define uh, reality as, as testified to us by the Creator, that it comes to us through revelation through scripture first before anything else that if anything else contradicts it that we are not to you know to shove things in there that are not warranted now i i am not talking about a 66 book canon i'm talking about scripture which goes beyond the leather uh binding uh but so if I, when I was a little child, if I were to go to my, my, my father and ask him questions about evolution, he would say, he wouldn't take me to a science book, he would take me to scripture and say, well, what does this have to say about it, right? So I was raised with that kind of mindset. Now, when I discovered um, Hebrew cosmology, uh, I, had been, I had been really fascinated with the concept of flat earth for many years. And um, back when uh, Daniel Shenton founded the uh, Flat Earth Society back in 2004. He started up, and yes, he's probably a government shill. I'll just tell everyone that now. I'm not promoting the Flat Earth Society. But I was really um, obsessed with finding out more about Flat Earth, not from a mockery standpoint, because I was really interested. I remember back in 2004, I went and visited his, uh, his, uh, his chat room, and I didn't get anything biblical there. It wasn't even in my in my mindset. Um, I it was I didn't understand any of it, and I kind of moved on. And when the uh, the flat Earth movement really took off in 2015, I, again, like I wasn't really hearing much about flat Earth. I, like I'd go be in YouTube chats like this, and people would come in and and sit, you know say things like space is fake, and I'd be like, what are you guys talking about? Like there was like no context to it. But finally, I was I remember I was in a YouTube chat, and there was being debated was the rapture, you know, pre trib, post trib, no rapture, you know, whatever. And and someone commented, hey, a flat Earth, this has shown up. A flat earther. And I'm like, really? I'm so excited. And so I went and approached this person, and that person said, you're going to hell. And I said, why am I going to hell? And he said, because you don't believe the earth is flat. And and he said that it's in the Bible. And this really sparked my interest. You know, I, I didn't, I could have taken the insult of, you know, how dare you say, you know, I'm going to hell. That's proof that this isn't real. But I, I immediately, I was like, really? It's in scripture? So I, I went and started searching, and I came, quickly came across this 19th century pen and ink sketch of Hebrew cosmology. It just it shows like the firmament and the mm-hmm. waters above. You know, it's just really simple. Now I've been praying about this stuff my entire life. I've been trying to figure out like, you know, what is this guy? Like, what do you mean waters above? And what is this firmament? I I, I could never really make I could never visualize and make sense of it. But when I saw that, it's like the entire all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation just crackled with animation. You know, I could see the new city of Jerusalem coming down and and Yeshua mm-hmm. ascending, and I could just I could see it all. I could see the waters of the flood you know coming down I, and it was just this amazing confirmation and so um i was a closeted flat earthist for about uh about a year i really didn't want to come out about it and when i was really feeling um uh the father really pushing on my heart to you know start writing about it and such um the first person I really wanted to talk to before I went public was my parents. And so I I was living in uh, Charleston, South Carolina at this time where I still am at this moment. And I flew all the way back to California to meet with them. And I sat in the living room with my dad and I, I, I said, you know, I, I kind of opened the conversation as I've opened up, you know, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of conversations with them about scripture. And I say, you know, I'm i I'm starting to notice some, some themes here in scripture that Moses writes about and the prophets and the apostles that doesn't actually line up with our cosmological worldview, you know, the Copernican revolution. Mm -hmm. And I start describing things like the firmaments and the waters of the great deep and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, the waters above. And and he just stopped me. He's like, Whoa, Whoa, I'm going to stop you right there. Now keep in mind, my dad is a pastor. He's multiple degrees. He's been to seminary and very educated. And he and he starts describing Hebrew cosmology better than than I did at that time. I mean, he's got it up and backwards and forwards. He he understood it. He he visualized the whole thing. And I said, Well, wait a second, Dad. Like, why didn't you ever talk to me about this before? Why didn't you ever tell me? And this is what he said. He said, I'm gonna go in the other room. I'm gonna get my physics textbook down. I'm gonna dust it off. I'm gonna come back in here and prove you wrong. He walked out of the room. He never came back. And I just sat in the living room, thinking. Oh my goodness. It was like in that moment where I realized the the spiritual power 
of this of, of Hebrew cosmology, what this holds on people. That, that what I what I started realizing is that, and he by the way he never came back, and and actually it's it's kind of sad because we we never had an argument, but he hasn't really spoken to me in about two three years. A large part because Danny Faulkner, Professor Danny Faulkner, the resident astronomer at AIG, uh, has publicly talked about me, and I'm in the newsletters, and he reads those, and he's probably really embarrassed uh, that his oh, son wow. is being mentioned. And uh, and yeah, we can talk about <laughs> we can talk about Professor Faulkner and how he's actually lying about the things that we're advocating and right. and falsely falsely testifying about what we actually you know. Believe, yeah. um, but um, you know what I have come to realize is that most people in the church who understand Scripture really well do not um, can visualize Hebrew cosmology like it is not that hard to connect the dots and see it once you kind of outline it. The, but the thing is, is that uh, this movement has very little to do with the shape of the earth. And as I constantly say, it has everything to do with the shape of humanity. And the reason why I think most people, there are some NASA fanboys out there that you really do love space. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, like for me, I never really cared about, like, I love star Wars, but it wasn't, I wasn't really into space. You know, I like, I like the mythology behind it, right. The storytelling, but, but what, what most people, the reason why they grab the globe and they hug it up to their bosom and they can't let it go, I think has very little to do with the shape of the earth. It has everything to do with everything in the earth. Because when you, when you realize that, you know, when you realize that the earth is flat, you, you see, uh, the big revelation, the, the ultimate really big one that did it for me when I realized that the earth was flat was I thought of the scripture verse where Satan uh, is tempting Yeshua in the wilderness. Yeah. And he takes him to a very high place. And Exceedingly the, the, high mountain, yes. Yeah. And, and, and he says that if you bow down and worship me, I'll, you know, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give this all to you. Yes. And, and, and that was the first time where I really got it. And I go, oh my goodness. Right. Like, it, it's all Satan's, like Nashville, Hollywood, Washington D.C., New York. You know, uh, you know the the the, uh, the Pentagon, uh, the Vatican, uh, Zionism. You know, it, it's all it's all his. Yes. And and that is, I think, that is what people don't want to give up. They don't. Right, they right. can't. They can't fathom the, the fact that it's you know globe Earth and everything in globe Earth is Satan's, and that's his kingdom. And and there's a reason why Yeshua said, you know, that his disciples don't fight for him because his you know kingdom is not of this world. Right. And so, um, and, and I think that's the big, that's the ultimate. For me, that's the big, big struggle I see in people. It's about the the shape of humanity, of having to recognize the true shape of humanity when you recognize the true shape of the earth. Um. So, anyways, yeah, that that's a little bit about kind of you know. And some people, I mean, have it, you know, way worse. I mean, but it's it's sad that, you know, a lot of us, it's it, I, I because of my beliefs and because of what I advocate, I'm not allowed over at a lot of my relatives house. They won't even have they won't. They say you can't come over. I mean, it's wow. it's 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 sad that. And again, it, it has nothing to do with this. I don't think it has anything to do with the shape of the earth. I think it's just right. they can't fathom. They can't deal with the, the ramifications of it. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah, even in my family, which I'm fortunate to have a very godly family, and uh, like there's a portion of my family that is awakened even to the New World Order and 9 11 and conspiracies and all that. But when it comes to uh, Flat Earth, I mean, they refuse. I mean, even though it's so very simple to determine that there is no curvature and that water will always assume a level and can in no manner adhere to a ball or take on a rounded form. And yet, you know, again, um, people will not uh, embrace this with open possibility, uh, which I, I, I want to go ahead and bring something up here because I know at some point, you and I will talk about this as well, but I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, the case against me as far as the Flat Earth and Globe um, court case that I've been involved in since June 11th of this past year is finally resolved, and we did win our case, and it is now closed. Uh, and even in Superior Court, that one has also been closed and um 
and everything's good now and I don't have to worry about or deal with all that but I will at some point very soon release the details and all that and how it's finally concluded and uh, for those that don't know I did release at and present on this at the last um, the Flat Earth International Conference and spoke about how others should also uh, you can stand for this truth even in a court of law and so um, yeah that's all finally concluded I'm so glad to be done with that and have that and it's set a precedence you know in a court of law with regard to this particular debate so that's uh intriguing as well but now now i sat in your presentation in dallas um and was it not concluded by that time well no the first case was concluded but he appealed it to the superior court and he also filed a perjury charge against me a case against me for he said i had perjured myself but you know that's just because he couldn't believe anything that I was talking about with regard to there being no curvature. And so he had to prove uh, that I had lied and that was impossible to do because I did not. And so he hired several lawyers this time uh, to join him in court and even tried to get the professor uh, at the University of Georgia to testify on, uh, in his behalf. And they, um, well, the professor refused, and then his counsel told him to concede, and so he finally did, and uh, now the Superior Court case is closed. I was going to counter, um, I was going to counter sue him this time for bringing me to court three times and defaming, you know, and also harassing me for, um, on this whole thing, but it all got resolved, and so it's done. But yeah, it's finally and, concluded. And we'll have to be talking about this uh, for my, you know, my next book, the Flat Earth Conferences, because yeah, this is yeah, an important absolutely. component of it. Yeah, the final case was supposed to be played out December sixteenth in the Superior Court Judge uh, Mingledorf here in Barrow County uh, at one p.m. But I just received a letter from his lawyer stating that. Um, you know, he's conceded and that there will not be a case. So nice. praise God. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So we got, um, just a, a little, like six minutes remaining brother. So, uh, anything else that you'd like to bring up and speak about, um, how, how many pages is this book and when do you foresee releasing the second and will you be doing a third part are you going to be covering every year of the flat earth international conference and ongoing well you know the uh robbie davidson is uh has resigned from yeah. uh the conferences and um, so it's kind of the end of an era and it was what, what robbie did and one of the things reason i'm writing the biography on the conferences is because what robbie did was he he gave legitimacy to the movement in the eyes of the world when we needed right. it really the right. most and so it served its purpose. It served its time. And I think what's going to happen next will be something different than what he has done. Um, and so I'll be ending it here. I'll be ending it in Dallas. Um, and the, one of the reasons that it's going to take me till next summer to have it done is that I'm opening up the floor to interviews for any and all who were uh, presenters at all the conferences, and not just because I'm going to be detailing their lives as well. And so it's going to be a very awesome. big, it's going to be a very big piece and it's going to be a very intricate with a lot of working pieces. Uh, and it's going to come together. It's like you said earlier on the show that when we go to these conferences, it's almost like a, like a family reunion. And, you know, we, all the people that we, you know, we've met before we've chatted with in these rooms or on social media or watch the videos and we all come together and it's just a wonderful time. And, um, and so it's going to be a, a really personal piece because, yeah, it's going to be bookmarked with the conferences, but then it's going to detail all the things that are happening in between. Um, you know, just like any family, we have our, <laughs> our fights and our disagreements, and sometimes family members don't talk to each other. Uh, so right. that, <laughs> right. you know, you, you, you sit on the opposite ends of the, uh, the far ends at the table at Thanksgiving. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, what a 
what a funny world we live in. You just got to laugh about it because, um, and I, I, it's just, it's unfortunate that we allow such nonsensical and non-salvational uh, dialogue to separate us and in love and, you know, when we should be um, really, I mean, again, even loving our enemies. But I'll, 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 I'll end on this story. My, um, my wife, you know, we, uh, we both uh, work together from home. And so we're always like, you know, 10 feet or so apart from each other. And she sat through like all the interviews I was giving. She was almost usually always in the room with me at that time. And so she, she didn't know who like Bob Nola was and, you know, David Weiss and, you know, Chris Van uh-huh. Matry uh-huh. and, and Paul and, you know, Rick Hummer. She knew like your names in Garcia, but she would like listen to all the stories. And so it was, I, I think she kind of maybe felt almost like a little tinge of, um, you know, jealousy by all the attention that all these other people were getting and the, the focus I was putting on, on all these individuals writing their stories and it was when we went to the conference in Dallas. Now she had she had to work. She did not take vacation time for it. But on the last night of the conference, uh, the VIP dinner, you were there for it, and the room was yeah. packed. And there was like a like a I don't know twelve to fifteen tables, big round tables, and people packed around in this big room. And she wanted to. She met you, and she wanted to. She, she started naming off all the names of the people she wanted to meet. Like, I want to meet, you know, Zen. I want to meet Bob Nodal. I want to meet. And so I would go up and I would be like, uh, you know, David Weiss, I'd like you to meet my wife, Sarah. And uh, Mark Sargent, you know, he was in this book as well. Mm-hmm. I'd like you to meet my wife, Sarah. And and it was finally, after meeting almost everyone, she sat down at the table and then she said, I want to meet Shelly Lewis. And she said her name. So I took my wife's hand, and Shelly Lewis was on the opposite end of the room, and I, I escorted her all the way over there. I tapped Shelly on the shoulder, and I said, uh, Shelly, I'd like you to meet my wife. And she, Shelly stood up and gave my wife a hug, and I could, see my awesome. wife, I could see my wife's face. And it was like this emotion that swept over her where she started – getting it like it started like really coming over her that that all these people what was happening in that room was something so much larger than ourselves and it was something so big we can't even we can't even really even in this book you can't really we don't know what the outcome is we can't wrap our head around this yet but it was it was you know it was just this really powerful emotional moment that you know i i'm gonna really carry with me and i'll definitely be writing about um you know when when she when she started putting all this together. So uh, that's probably a, a, a good story to end on. Yeah, um, yeah. And for your wife to be able to share that with you, um, yeah. I don't know where she is with the this aspect of research or even if she really cares, but to have that kind of a, you know, face put on this movement and your involvement in it, I... I think now, you know, at least she understands differently than she may have previously. Yeah, she, she, no, she's she's behind my research, and she one of her wonderful attributes is that she has the gift of faith, and and you know, so if the if scripture says it, she believes it. So, yeah. uh, she's with me on on flat Earth and tour pursuance and all that, and uh, she's been with me the whole way. But you know, obviously, it's not something that like, you know, like like many people maybe many women out there like she it's like okay yeah the earth is flat i don't really want to you know i don't really care to talk about it all the time right and you know research and that kind of stuff so but she so she supports what i do that's awesome brother uh one minute remaining final comment for listening audience and also you know once again your um blog okay well yeah thanks for zen for having me on the show it was it was oh, really gosh, w- wonderful meeting you for the first time in Dallas uh, after knowing you for you know a couple of years and right. having a, 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 a history. Some of it's <laughs> tumultuous, which <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I, I I'm I, you know I loved uh, I'm so glad I can call you my friend and um, and so my blog is our way is the highway. Uh, where I put a lot of articles and all my research up. And then, of course, my book, uh, Unexpected Cosmology, which is sold on uh, Sacred Word Publishing's bookstore. And you can get Worthless Mysteries at this point in time on Amazon.com, but we'll probably make it available on uh, Sacred Word as well in the, in the near future. All right. Excellent, brother. Well, keep us uh, in mind with your research and what you have going on with you. And uh, let's touch base every once in a while. And uh you know, bring what you are involved in and your endeavors and share them with the world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. 
All right. Be blessed. Good night, everyone. And thanks again for uh, sharing your attention and joining us in live broadcast. We appreciate and love all of you. And um, just thank you again for all of your kindness and your support. And please do support Noel and all of his work and check out his books. God bless all. Good night.